Hi, it's Jake here. Welcome to Voluntary Life. This episode is about investing and it's a discussion which I hope is going to provide some really helpful um, pointers about how to understand uh, what's going on in the economy and how it affects you. And just before we start, um, I would like to just say that I will put links to all of the ideas discussed in the show notes for this um, discussion. I'm talking to Mike, who's one of the um, administrators and contributors to a forum called the Permanent Portfolio Forum, which is an online uh, discussion forum. And his board name is Medium Text, and he'll tell you a bit more about uh, his experience and background in the podcast. But just in case you haven't heard some of the previous episodes on investing that I've done, we're talking about an approach to investing called the Permanent Portfolio, which is an approach that individual savers and investors can take for themselves to protect themselves in different economic circumstances. It's an approach that involves having a balanced portfolio split 25% each between stocks, long-term bonds, cash, and gold. And the reason for that approach is that it provides security in many different circumstances. If you'd like to find out more about that, um, you can look at Harry Brown's book, Fail Safe Investing, which I'll put in the show notes, and at the Permanent Portfolio Forum, and indeed uh, have a listen also to some of the previous episodes that I've done on investing. But you'll also find out more about some of the ideas in this discussion. And as I have said before, I'm not any kind of registered financial advisor, and neither is my guest on, on this episode. Nothing that we talk about um, constitutes any kind of financial advice. It's up to you what you do with your money, and it's your responsibility. And this discussion is just provided for information as our opinions about investing. But as we're both individual personal investors, I hope it's uh, also useful to, for you to hear the experiences of, of um, other people uh, and the approaches that we're taking so that it can help inform you about the approach that you take towards your own um, finances. So I hope this is useful and thank you so much for listening. I'm very pleased to have a special guest on. It is Mike, who is one of the main users and writers of the Permanent Portfolio Forum online. And I, Mike, your, your name online is Medium Text, is that right? That's right, that's right. So welcome to the show, Mike. Oh, it's great to be with you, Jake. <laughs> now, um, for those who don't know, the forum where we met is, is a place where people who have this approach to investing called the Permanent Portfolio discuss their you know, um, investments as, as private individuals and, and private investors. But I wonder if, um, if you could just start us off by telling us a little bit about how you got interested in investing as a private individual, what your background was, you know, what took you to, to the point where you know, you've, you've now been uh, on the forum for some time. And as we'll talk about, you've, I know you've got an upcoming book too. So, so how did you sort of get started in this field? Right. Well, uh, I, I had tried many different approaches to investing with, with uh, very mixed results, really, I think, which is pretty typical of, of, of most amateur investors. Um, but when 2008 came along, I, I think that it, it, it sort of scarred people and traumatized them in, in different ways. Uh, and and it, it, I think it made people begin looking much more diligently for some approach to investing that, that might actually work kind of under all you know, economic conditions. And for me, I had actually read some of Harry Brown's work that, that was not investment related. And after reading that work, uh, one of them being How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World, which I think you touched on in an earlier podcast. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I became aware that this guy also had written on investing. And so I I began reading his investment books, and and like a lot of permanent portfolio investors, at first it just seemed very odd, uh, just a little too counterintuitive for me. But along about this same time, the, the 2008 financial crisis was beginning to unfold. And so I sort of I, – I had started to implement some of Harry Brown's ideas, and it was very interesting to kind of watch watch them be – kind of stress tested in real time as the 2008 crisis unfolded. And I, I like a lot of 
permanent portfolio investors was was really amazed at how well it did, how well the theory held up under really about the most extreme conditions you're ever going to see. Mm. And and that that really sold me on it. And uh, I, I I began just you know reading everything I could get my hands on about it, thinking about every possible kind of facet to the strategy I could, thinking about different ways it, it might break down, it might stop working. Um, and uh, professionally, I work with uh, retirement plan design and compliance and, and a little bit of institutional uh, uh, money management. And so I, I'm i sort of around the conventional wisdom about investing every day. And, and of course, you're not going to hear much about a permanent portfolio type approach in that environment. But i um, it, it was interesting for me to to be able to kind of bounce some of these ideas off of professional money managers and get their thoughts on on it, and so uh, I, I became, you know, essentially won over to to the concept, mm. and it was about that time that that the the mammoth Bogleheads uh, permanent portfolio discussion was was getting some steam behind it, and that was just such a such a, a wonderful informative, stimulating discussion that um, I, I think, you know, Craig felt like, why not have a forum where this is all we do? And so uh, he set up the forum and he asked me to help out with it. And we initially set it up as, as kind of uh, an adjunct to his, his blog. And then later on, we decided to put it on its own website. And that's where we came up with the gyroscopic investing website idea of you know what that's what the permanent portfolio really is is it's it's an approach to investing where no matter what happens it doesn't fall over it doesn't collapse it doesn't let you down it just keeps on it it it, it stays centered and it it it, it keeps going right. and uh, absolutely yeah I, I think this is one of the reasons that you know that i i became very interested in in this approach is is really to as a as an individual sort of who wants to plan for for the future and uh, and so forth. You, one of the things that you see is how devastating um, different uh, things happening in the economy can be to private savers uh, and investors. And you know the approach of the permanent portfolio is really about protecting yourself um, no matter what what um, what might happen in the future. And I think, you know, one of the things that I've, I've really I've found really helpful that I think other people would find helpful is that in the discussions that you have on the forum about um, in, uh, the permanent portfolio, when you talk about the different economic circumstances that can take place, you know, I think for a lot of people, it's very confusing to see all of the um, financial media that, that we get um, every day with different types of, of information about uh, what's going on in the economy, you know, what the government policy is doing and so forth. And one of the things I found very helpful is the way that you have a way of describing how to look at the economy that I think for individuals trying to understand where they are and what might be going on with their savings and so forth, it can be really a really helpful approach. And I wonder if you could sort of summarize how do you cut through all of the you know different uh, news and and uh, financial information to, to to get your understanding of what's going on in the economy. Sure. So, you know, th these ideas are Harry Brown's. Um, I, I'm I'm essentially just just kind of you know carrying the torch of, of his ideas that that I think really do make a lot of sense. But I think when you're trying to understand any system. It's helpful to understand what its boundaries are and what the entire universe of of possibilities looks like. And so, with the weather, you might say, you know, it's raining or it's not raining, and and that will cover every possible weather configuration. Right. And so, with the economy, um, it's always the case that the underlying economy is either expanding or contracting. The, those are the only options. I mean, I suppose it could be, you know exactly stable, but that's not going to be the case for more than a few minutes. Right. So it's always either in the process of, of some sort of expansion or some sort of contraction. And at the same time, the money supply is doing the same thing. It's either expanding or it's contracting. And I think the goal of these central banks is to make the money supply 
uh, expand at more or less the same rate as the economy does. And when the economy is contracting, they want to make sure that the money supply is not also contracting in a way to create this sort of deflationary spiral situation that everyone talks about. But if you if you say <clears throat> um, the only options we have is that the money supply can be expanding or contracting and the economy can be expanding or contracting, the question then is, what what conclusions can you draw from those observations that you can put into practice, uh, you know, effectively? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Let Let's look at that um, maybe in a bit more specific detail for people to understand. So, for example, you know, you mentioned that we can look at it as either the money supply growing or shrinking, and the economy growing or shrinking, and a combination of those two variables. So. What what does it look like when you have a situation where you have money supply growth and the real economy shrinking? Well, I, I would think that would be a situation where you had uh, inflation that wasn't being accompanied by prosperity. Mm. So if you look at the 1970s in the U.S., for example, um, the the economy seemed to be sort of stuck in neutral um, the government couldn't figure out what, what the problem was, what, what was needed to get things moving again. And so there's this very loose monetary policy, I guess, with this idea that if you throw enough money into the economy, it, you know, you, you, you put enough fuel on the fire, eventually you'll get, you'll get something good. Mm. Um, so you, in that environment, you had a lot of inflation. You didn't have a lot of economic prosperity. And as a result, uh, you saw that, that gold as an asset performed very, very well. Um, stocks uh, basically did nothing in the 1970s. Um, bonds did not do well. And people who held cash did pretty well because short-term rates uh, more or less tracked inflation. So just an investment in cash, you know, it, it, it didn't do too, too badly at all. Right. But as a private investor, you know, if you had a sort of typical stocks, bonds, split you know that that period of time was i think it's sometimes referred to as like the um you know a hidden stock market crash because although the stocks sort of rose a bit the inflation was eating away at value and so you know you would as a private investor if you followed a sort of typical typical um investment um allocation of maybe you know some some split between stocks and bonds that that kind of environment where you have monetary growth but um, but no real economic growth or you know or in even economic recession that can really um, that can really hurt um, individual investors wouldn't you say right right well you know in the U S from nineteen sixty six to nineteen eighty two the stock market did absolutely nothing mm. so if you had if you had invested in stocks on, on a uh, I guess a nominal basis you would have you would be right back where you started. But on an inflation-adjusted basis, it would have been a disaster mm. because you would have sat through a decade of, of, of high inflation and the purchasing power of those dollars just would have been decimated, as would you know an investment in, in, in long-term bonds at different points in the 1970s where uh, you know whatever interest rates were when you bought the bonds, they promptly went up from there, causing the value of your bonds to go down. So I, I think that, that that's... One of the things that people compare the, the permanent portfolio to is more conventional allocations, mm -hmm. such as, say, 40%, 35 40% stocks and, and you know, 60 65% bonds. And over most periods of time, the portfolio is has similar returns to that, except when you go back to the 1970s and you find multiple years where this, this alternative strategy doesn't do well at all, while the permanent portfolio, it just does its job of, of providing continuing to provide stable inflation adjusted returns in the three to 4% range. And that's, re that's really, I think what a lot of investors, that's all they really want is they yeah. want a stable return, mm. something that they can rely on. So it's that kind of situation where you have monetary growth um, with, you know, without real economic growth. That's why we hold precious metals or in particular gold in the permanent portfolio is really to protect you in, in that kind of circumstance. Is that right? That's right. That's right. right. And, and I, I think, too, that um, when you're talking about monetary growth without economic growth, um, that's almost never a, a phenomenon that's 
that's existing in isolation. It normally means that you've got some other serious problems in the economy. Maybe you've got some problems with just the political stability in general, because you often find that situation in, 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 in countries that have kind of a, a, an uncertain political situation. So I think, you know, gold becomes a hedge against a, just a generalized sense of, of uncertainty, whether it be political, economic, monetary, whatever. It, and it, it just so happens that expansion of, of the money supply without expansion of the economy tends to travel with those other kind of social, cultural, political problems. And so, uh, but, but yeah, yeah, you definitely, you want to hold gold for that scenario uh, as well as the kinds of scenarios that often accompany that, that situation. Right, right. Well, I, I do want to come on to, you know, some, maybe some more of the dramatic type of um, uh, disaster scenario, I suppose, where gold can, can play an important role. Because I know you have some interesting thoughts on that. But before we do, just to sort of give a bit of a rounded view. So that was if you have monetary growth and the economy is shrinking. Now, what about if you have the money supply shrinking and the economy shrinking? Now, that is that what you call a tight money uh, recession? Well, I would I would call that a depression. Right. Uh, re- really, I, I think that that what what Harry Brown described as a tight money recession would be a situation where, uh, I mean, I, I guess it it would it would meet the the criteria you just described of a situation where you have a central bank raising interest rates in the middle of an economy that's not expanding or or perhaps even contracting, with the hope that it will tame. Uh, in, inflation. You know, in, inflation that has gotten out of hand. Um, so the, what, what Harry Brown talked about when discussing that scenario, though, is that it's sort of by definition a temporary situation because you can only raise interest rates so much before you completely destroy the economy um, or, you, you, or your inflation is, 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 uh, is tamed. Right. But, um, so, so I guess that, that the situation you're describing w- would include a tight money recession scenario, um, as well as just a, a what we would think of as, a, as an economic depression scenario as well. So what would be examples of what, what that looked like? You know, when have we seen that happen? Because the one that strikes me for the tight money one is the sort of the end of the 1970s inflation, like the 1980 sort of period when in the US and, and in the UK there was... Uh, um, a kind of change in monetary policy is that is that the t- sort of and it, and it was also I think during the recession as well. But is that the kind of um, is that what that looks like? Right, right, right. Where um, you know, I mean, n- normally you would never expect a central bank to raise interest rates in the middle of a recession. Um, so I think that that a tight money recession is is a bit of a uh, a, a, a rare. Or, you know, a rare beast, but it, it, that would be an example in the early 1980s of, uh, of a central bank making a calculated decision to raise interest rates with the hope of, of taming inflation, even though the economy was still very sick, very weak, and the, the, the interest rate increases were likely to tip it back into recession, and that's, that's what happened. Hmm. And you don't think that we're likely to see anything? I mean, obviously, we can't, well, you know, one of the things that we approach is of the permanent portfolio is you just can't predict, so you're preparing for any circumstances. But uh, I know that, you know, you've written on the on the discussion forum that this is a situation that you don't think we're, that you think is an extremely unlikely thing for us to see um, again, you know, a kind of tight money recession. Is that your view? And, and why would you say that? Well, th- that's my impression just based upon, uh, you know the current Fed chairman Ben Bernanke. He he seems far more interested in uh, uh, maintaining this very low interest rate environment, with the hope that that it will eventually begin to to kickstart economic activity. And to a degree, I, I think that it, it's worked in the last three or four years. I mean, you you look at the health of an economy two or three years after a, a real financial crisis, and where we're at right now, from a historical perspective, is actually not that bad. So I think that, that, you know, the question, though, is, is where do these policies lead in the future? You know, mm. and I think that's, that's, that's the unanswered question. But um, it, it, certainly anything's possible. But uh, it, it would, it, you know, I, I, I was reading Alan Greenspan's book a while back, and he talked about how when he was watching um, Volcker, the, the Fed chairman in the early 1980s, 
do these interest rate increases. He said he just marveled at the amount of political courage it took to do that because it was literally an action no one understood, no one supported, and uh, he did it, and, and you know, it, apparently it worked. But the idea that a future Fed chairman would have that much courage and willpower and focus, um, it, it, it seems unlikely to me, though it certainly could happen. Right. Now, in, in, for individual um, savers and investors, what happens to you in a situation where you have uh, this kind of tight money um, recession? You know, let's say you're holding some stocks, you're holding uh, bonds, you're holding, uh, you know, at those, in those circumstances, that is, again, a pretty bad place to, to, to have, um, for example, stocks isn't it because that the, oh i mean if you have if you have a central bank that's raising interest rates when the economy is very weak i can't imagine that would be good for anybody because mm -hmm. if you're a, if you're a if you're a borrower you don't like paying higher interest costs and if you're if you're if you're a business person the idea of having to pay more for credit while you can't pass any of those costs along to your 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 customers because there's just soft demand across the whole economy um, you know not good if you're if you're looking for a house and you're trying to get a mortgage you know and you see interest rates going up not that's not good and then of course that translates into weaker home prices if you have fewer people out there shopping for them and the the monthly payments going to be more because the interest rate on the mortgage is higher. It just seems like there's there's really it's not good for anyone except that person who happens to be holding cash. Right. If you're if you're holding cash in that kind of environment, you're going to you know basically be pacing the central bank as they raise interest rates. It should translate into higher rates on on very short term deposits like T bills and, and that sort of thing. And so the person who's sitting on all cash should do should do okay in that kind of environment. Mm -hmm. And that's and that was that was part of Harry Brown's rationale for having 25 percent of the portfolio in cash. Is one, it provides you liquidity in all environments, but two, it provides you an asset that can that can help keep the rest of the portfolio afloat in this unusual kind of scenario that we're describing. Right, absolutely. And I remember that when he wrote about that, he was saying in that kind of scenario, as you say, you know, it's it's a it's a really bad situation for everyone. Um, cash is is okay, but even then I don't I think uh, it's, it's likely to be such a, a bad economic situation that, you know, it's, it's not like um, a huge opportunity, I suppose. It's more like we hold cash as part of the portfolio because that will, to some extent, save us in those circumstances from even more devastating uh, losses. But I believe that was it not in that time that the permanent portfolio is one of the few years that it had a negative real return? Yes, yes, yes. I think if you, if you look at the last 40 years of permanent portfolio performance, you find that it's... It's, if it wasn't its worst year, it was it, one of its worst two years. I think it was 1981 or 1982, where I think it, it lost 5 or 6%. Mm. Uh, and, and, of course, that was in an environment where everything was losing a lot. But, uh, but that, those kind of economic conditions, they're just very hard to plan for because it's almost like the government is deliberately making things worse. Uh, and that's that's an unusual thing. I mean, the, the government is typically, I mean, the central bank, the government, they're typically trying to do things to make the economy better. Um, so to have them deliberately raising rates when the economy is already very weak, I have to think that's that's something that's not going to happen frequently. Mm, right. Absolutely. So what about a situation where you have economic growth and monetary growth? Well, I, th I think that's that's kind of the Goldilocks economy that 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 the current, you know, central banks of the world would like to have is you have um, steady, stable economic growth and you have uh, money supply growth that is either tracking that economic growth exactly or maybe a little bit ahead of it. So I think when they talk about um, an inflation target of 2 to 3 percent, I think what they're talking about is uh, we're going to basically find out what the economy is doing and increase the money supply a little bit more than that. Mm. Right. And I suppose the, I guess the 19, 1980s, 1990s was a kind of long boom period with, a, with, a, with some blips in it. But, but I mean, I, I, I guess the growth of the, of the 90s in particular would be one example of that type of, uh, of period, would you say? Absolutely. And, and I think that, that one of the things that people get confused about when talking about gold, they, they, they kind of fixate on this gold as an inflation hedge concept without 
necessarily appreciating that that's not the whole story with gold. And you can have years and years and years of inflation and gold can do nothing if the inflation is accompanied by a healthy economy, economic growth, and uh, what, what, they, what they call uh, positive real interest rates. Mm. Uh, in that environment, gold is, is not appealing. Um, and so, you know, you saw, you saw some rate of inflation every single year from 1982 to, you know, 2007 and, uh, between 82 and say 2000, the price of gold did basically went nowhere and it went nowhere because the other conditions necessary for gold to do well were not present. Um, but yes, I, I think that the, the, the 1982 to 2000 economy in the U S was just is about as close to perfect economic conditions as you could ever hope to find, because you had you had uh, a favorable kind of debt profile, you had a favorable demographic profile, you had politicians who were willing to do anything to juice the economy, you had very very uh, accommodative central bank policies, uh, interest rates were falling the whole time. I mean, it's it's as close to a perfect economic environment as I as I can imagine. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, I think in some ways, when you see what, what happened afterwards, there was a lot of trouble brewing during that period, particularly in terms of government finances and so forth. But I understand, I understand the point that you're making. And, and I suppose, from the individual's perspective, if you're interested in protecting your, your own savings and so forth, if you're in that kind of environment, that's really where stocks um, you know, give you quite a lot of growth, isn't it? I mean, that was sort of, I guess, oh, what we absolutely. saw in that period. No, no, if you look at the four assets in the permanent portfolio, um, short-term treasury bills, long-term treasury bonds, gold, and stocks, stocks are easily the asset that would be expected to, the, to do the best over time because with stocks, you're actually, you're actually owning a piece of a, a wealth-generating part of the economy. Right, you know, right. A, 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 a private company that has some new product or new service that, that everybody likes and wants to buy, there's not a better wealth generation device that I can imagine other than that, you know. Uh, so, so, you know, I think you have to own stocks uh, because when you do have prosperity, stocks just, just perform extraordinarily well. Mm, absolutely. Uh, and, and if it wasn't for all of the mess that we're in with the money, um, with the, the monetary system, I mean, I guess, you know, our portfolios would probably be more heavily weighted towards stocks because you, that, as you say, that is that the stocks have really um, reflect the, the source of, uh, of true growth in the world, you know, where we have companies creating new things and new services, products and services, um, uh, which, which give us greater prosperity. But, um, but we're dealing with such a complicated um, uh, and unstable system um, with the growing and shrinking of the money supply at the same time that that's, I guess, why we have to um, balance some ownership of stocks with other assets that will do well in other, um, in other conditions as well. Well, and I think the point you're making, it, it, it sort of bumps into a larger historical truth of the history of the world is of peaceful, productive efforts being disrupted by either invaders or natural disasters or incompetence or whatever. But, but this process that we're describing, it's, you know, it's as old as the hills in my view of everything is going well and then something happens to mess it up. And, and what it often is, is you have a country that's peaceful and prosperous and they're simply invaded and conquered by another nation and all of the things that were good now are gone. All of the, the efficient deployments of capital are destroyed and so the person who in that environment said, I'm just going to invest in these productive efforts because this clearly is the best way to protect my capital and grow it. And that, that, that works out fine until the volcano erupts or the, the barbarians invade or, you know, there's a coup or a rebellion. And all of a sudden, all of that carefully allocated capital can be completely destroyed in a very short period. And then you own nothing. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's a question of being prepared for all the things that you can imagine happening, which I guess is the, and that's what really um, appealed to me about the concepts of permanent portfolio, because that's really what it's about. Yes, that, that's, that's right. That's right. So how about just looking at the, you know, the, the, the different circumstances? How about a situation where you have economic growth, but 
the money supply shrinking? Well, you know, I think what you're talking about there is essentially a gold standard world. That was what I was going to say. That's right, right, right. Where you have a money supply that's that's very, it, it's not impossible, but it's difficult to expand dramatically. And when you're having dramatic economic expansion, um, one would expect there to be a lot of deflation where you have um, a lot more economic activity um, being accompanied by a money supply that, that's not expanding much. And, you know, I think that this, that was the case for most of the 1800s and for the, the very early part of the, of the, of the 20th century. Um, and uh, apparently that kind of arrangement, there are certain, you know, groups in society that, that, that don't like it, um, primarily debtors. So I think that, you know, in the early 20th century, you saw this populist movements of farmers and, and other people who were, you know, basically debtor type, you know, uh, members of, of the economy, and they they hated it. They 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 viewed the gold standard as a nightmare, and and so you know I, I think that what the world we we have today is the result in part of of you know more than just evil central bankers. I think there's a, a degree of populism in it as well, of mm. members of society who just felt like they would do better under a system where the money supply could be increased kind of at will. Right. Right. Yeah, I guess there's not there's not much point in talking about planning for for that world um, because we won't, in a sense, we won't really see that situation, will we? It's like I, it's it's really hard for me to imagine. I mean, people people talk about going back to a gold standard, but it, it, when you really begin working through what would have to happen for that to occur, it to me it's just almost inconceivable because you're talking about politicians giving power away and they just mm. they just don't do that yeah. and central banks doing the same thing of saying we've now we've now gotten the control over the money supply you're asking us to give it back yeah. um you know that's 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 hard for me to envision but just as a as a sort of to to give an understanding of it i think what it looks like in that world is you have economic growth and falling prices and that's what people experienced all the way through the 19th century where standard of living increased massively um, prosperity happened they people people's um, living standards and real um, experience of life got better and better but they also experienced prices falling and you know, this is the one thing that um, I guess kind of modern economics since Keynesianism hasn't really ha that that's the sort of scenario that's kind of disappeared from people's minds because the idea of deflationary prices is uh, is kind of uh, often touted as um as the thing that we have to avoid because that's where all disaster happens whereas actually um you know we had in the 19th century uh, you know 100 years where you had prices of all of the sort of main um goods of life falling at the same time uh, when as people's standard of living were increasing massively right 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 and, and you know i think that one of the nice things about the permanent portfolio is it's not really necessary to decide which world is better mm -hmm. you know um, you can you can sort of study the, the the gold standard world and imagine what it would be like and uh you know you can you, you certainly can't argue with the fact that the 20th century was probably the most prosperous in all of human history. And who's to say that, that some of these central bank policies didn't perhaps assist with that? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think it's necessary to view the gold standard as like preferable and ideal compared to the world we have today. I think that you can, you can just say that in the world we have today, uh, there are certain ways of protecting yourself and the permanent portfolio offers some pretty stout protection, you mm. know, Absolutely. Now, I want to come back to one of the scenarios that I mentioned a sort of tight money recession, a short shock of money supply shrinking at the same time as a recession. And you were saying that, you know, yes, that that can happen as a short term thing. But you also mentioned depression. Can you just explain to me, you know, how what you know, what you how you would characterize what is going on in a depression? And what happens to individual savers and investors when that happens? Well, my understanding of a depression is where the plans that people make and imagine for the future, they just don't come to fruition. So they imagine they'll be able to pay off debts because they imagine that they'll make more money because they imagine that the value of their property will increase. 
And everybody begins to participate in this kind of group mania of thinking that uh, some extraordinary level of economic growth is somehow the new norm, and that can be projected forward into perpetuity. And what happens is I think you're often able to do that for a few years through, through a combination of leverage and just what I might call kind of economic gadget plays mm-hmm. where you keep the prosperity going. And, and, and you might say that that's what happened in the U.S. after 2000. Um, the economy was clearly not as healthy as it had been in the 80s and 90s, but the government was able to put together these, these gadget plays of, of tax cuts and tax incentives and tax rebates, and the Fed was able to cut rates and – you know, we went to we went to war twice, and wars typically stimulate an economy. So you do all these things to kind of try to keep the party going, but people begin to notice it's just not it's just getting harder and harder to do the same thing that we did last year. And finally, you reach a point where all of that debt that was accumulated, trying to keep the party going at the same rate it had been in the past, all of that debt will have translated into speculation in various assets, and the economy will just be badly out of balance. And when prices begin trying to re- return to some kind of equilibrium based on what, upon what people can actually afford and what things are actually worth, you find that people now have these debts they ran up to buy these assets at, at inflated prices. They can't, they can't service this debt anymore. You have people who were relying on the ability to roll over short-term debt endlessly. And one day they wake up and nobody wants to roll their debt over and you Mm. find your banks going, going out of business in that environment, in that situation. And just the whole thing begins to feed on itself where, um, companies cut because they perceive that there's a lot less demand for their products. They lay people off. The people who are laid off or are afraid they'll be laid off, they spend less, they borrow less. And the whole process kind of feeds on itself and it, it, it's it's harder to stop than you would imagine, I think, because a part of it there has kind of a psychological dimension to it, where once people get scared and they lose their optimism about the economy in general, it's hard to get it back. Mm. And so I, I think that's one of the reasons that, that a real financial crisis almost is almost always followed by many years of, of subpar you know, economic activity, just because it costs people a lot of money and lost the lost value in assets, it traumatizes them psychologically. They're just simply not as optimistic as they were before. And so I think all of those ingredients go into what we think of as a depression. Now, when you talk about this, are you thinking of like the hangover that followed the 1920s, you know, the when people woke up from that, um, all of the, the kind of uh, overstimulated economy as after, just after the Fed got going, uh, into the Great Depression of the 1930s. Is that, is that the kind of situation that you're talking about? I mean, I think that's, that's kind of the, the uh, what you might call, that's like the rated R or the extreme example mm. uh, of depression. And then Japan in the 1990s, you might say that's more of a, maybe kind of like a PG-13 or right, more of a, right. a, a milder expression of that kind of environment. But yeah, I, I think that's, that's what it is. Uh, you've got, uh, you've got an economy that's overheated, way too much speculative activity. People have made absurd assumptions about, about future economic growth and their, in their, their, their future personal situation. And, when it all unwinds, it's, it can be very hard to stop the unwinding, you know. Mm. Now, what do you do, you know, what happens to you personally as an investor or saver in that kind of environment? Let's say you're in Japan in the 90s or in the Great Depression, you know, what, how do you protect yourself in that, in that kind of uh, situation? Well, um, w- what you find in that environment is... Uh, of course, stocks, nobody wants to own stocks. I mean, no one would want to own stocks when corporate earnings are plunging. And um, in that kind of environment, gold can go one of, I mean, gold can do different things. Um, One thought about gold in that environment is people, in that environment, people are typically selling everything. And so it makes sense they would be selling gold as well. Mm. But um, what history actually suggests is that gold tends to do pretty well in those environments simply because Investors look down the road and say, you know what, the government won't allow this 
environment, this environment to continue indefinitely, they will crank up the printing presses at some right, point to right. try to get, get things back on track. So I think that on the one hand, you have, you know, downward pressure on the price of gold. And, and it may be that, that over a longer period during those environments, you will have upward pressure on the price of gold. So in, in, in the current bull market for gold, for example, you saw in 2008, the price of gold went down a lot. But shortly after that, it got right back on track and began rising again. Mm. Uh, and, and through sort of a, a little, you know, an entirely different kind of process. But in the 1930s, when the U.S. government uh, unilaterally, you know, devalued the dollar and increased the value of gold from $20 an ounce to $35 an ounce, it was a similar kind of thing of uh, the only way to get I mean, I think the perception is the only way to get the economy moving again is to get dollars in circulation. And the way to do that is to create some inflation and some expectations that if you don't spend your money today, it's going to be worth less tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of process, you know, a lot over the longer term, of course, that's good for gold. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, but one of the things, the reason I ask is because one of the things that Harry Brown talks about is that the, one of the reasons that we own um, long-term bonds in the portfolio is because in a real depressionary situation, um, they are one of the only assets that, that do well. And I wonder if you could just sort of say a few words about your thoughts about, you know, whether you think that's borne out in the different cases that you've mentioned, the 30s and, and Japan and, you know, also, interestingly, um, the 2008-type situation, and, and why it is that that is, you know, something that you, it can be useful to hold within your portfolio for those circumstances. Right. So, well, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding around, around gold and what actually drives the price and why you would actually want to own gold. I think that for the average investor, there's even less understanding around, around owning long-term treasuries. Um, I, I think... That you talk to bond traders, of course, they understand it perfectly well, and and I, I have no doubt that there are pl plenty of, of sophisticated bond traders in the world who know exactly what they're doing, and they've made a lot of money in recent years. But for the typical investor, there's this kind of conventional wisdom that once interest rates reach a certain point, um, it's foolish to buy bonds. Once interest rates are at four and a half percent, nobody would buy bonds. That's 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 too low a rate to lock in for thirty years. But the truth about bonds is that you're simply buying an asset that ahead of the herd, in where in a crisis you find everybody wants to own bonds because everybody wants to own the asset they know they're not going to lose money on. That is, they know they're going to get their money back when they sell them. Right. And so what, what you find is in, in a real crisis, the, the interest rate you see on debt that's perceived to be risk-free, that interest rate will go down simply because you have a lot more demand for that kind of debt. So, so in 2008, it was just a wonderful example of that. Interest rates were in the mid-fours at the beginning of the year, and they were in the high twos by the end of the year. And ironically, the, 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 the conventional wisdom, the narrative that everyone thought was just too obvious in the first part of 2008 is that interest rates are about to start shooting higher. And anybody who buys bonds at four and a half percent is just just a, really a complete fool, and that's just that's just an inconceivable thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, and by the end of the year, that asset had gone up thirty five, forty percent in value, mm -hmm. and it was because you know yet again you know the market surprised us, reality surprised us, things unfolded in a very different way from what people were expecting, and only the person who had blindly bought the bonds as part of a kind of market neutral strategy like the permanent portfolio, only those people were able to, to participate in that rally just because this, the, the, if you read the, the financial press, you listen to, you know, watch TV, everybody was screaming, don't own treasuries right now, it's a, you're going to get slaughtered. Mm. Right, absolutely, yeah, and um, and funnily enough, then also in two thousand and eleven as well. Uh, oh the, yes, uh... absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, it, it, it was the exact same story. It was just told a slightly different way. Yeah, because the, 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 after two thousand and eight, the the story was well, okay, that happened, but now you really will be slaughtered if you own them. <laughs> and then exactly, have... <laughs> and, and everybody was talking about how the U.S. debt's going to get downgraded, and then the world's going to end, and you know, it's just going to be a disaster. And 
it, you know, I think anyone with a sense of history would look, look back and say, well, that's not what happened in Japan. Japan has been downgraded on numerous occasions, and the response has always been interest rates have gone lower. Mm. I, I think that, that it, it's sort of humorous to me that all of these same rating agencies that basically completely missed the 2008 crisis – Somehow they now have it right, you know, about downgrading U.S. debt. And, of course, they had it precisely wrong because right when they downgraded it, um, interest rates plummeted as the perception was that, that now U.S. Treasuries are safer than ever, you know. Right. Um, but, but it just goes to show that, that, you know, watching the financial, watching financial television, you know, reading the financial press, it's, it, it can certainly be entertaining and stimulating. But as far as really getting useful um, kind of market, you know, investment ideas from that, it just seems to me that, that that's, that's almost impossible to do because what, what, they're, what everyone's excited about as often as not is exactly wrong as yes. opposed to being exactly right. Yeah, absolutely. I wonder if you could um, say your thoughts on how you would characterize, you know, the environment that we now have. Um, in the U.S. and and uh, I mean I think the U.K. follows behind um, what sort of situation that you've got in the U.S. pretty closely. But what would you you know how do you view? Um, are we in the middle of a Great Depression? I mean, what do you how do you view where we're at? Well, I mean you know rather than taking the bait to make a prediction, <laughs> I think that that at any point in time it's very useful to be able to make a solid case to yourself for any any market environment going forward. So I can certainly very easily imagine a future with a lot of inflation, but I can also imagine a future with a lot of deflation, um, given the you know the demographic situation in the developed world and what has actually happened in, in countries like Japan, which are, you know, arguably 10 or 20 years ahead of the U.S. and, and, and you know, the rest of the industrialized world. Um, so I can, I can see the deflationary scenario. I can see the inflationary scenario. And, uh, you know, from a historical perspective, uh, these long-term bear markets for stocks, eventually they end. And, and we're in about year 12 of this one. Mm. And so normally these things end right when everyone is convinced they're going to go on forever. So I can very easily imagine a world with, you know, a lot of prosperity kicking off in the next few years, um, especially if you have some kind of technological breakthrough that, that's not on anybody's radar right now, something, you know, maybe in the energy space mm -hmm. or some kind of, you know, uh, you know, medical breakthrough. I mean, something like that can very easily you know, kind of get the whole economy really, really rocking again. So I, I can, I can, I can really see, you know, in any of those environments unfolding. And, uh, uh, I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm just happy that I feel like I'm protected in, in, in any of those events. Uh, because to me, I can, it can easily see any of them occurring. Mm. Fantastic. I think that's very, uh, a very, um, uh, uh practical and, and, uh, and realistic and helpful way of looking at it. So, you know, you've, you've described really, uh, really helpfully the sort of different ways in which um, different circumstances can, can affect um, a private um, individual investor and saver. Now, you, um, along with Craig from the forum, you're writing a book about the permanent portfolio. And I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about, you know, why are you writing this book, and sort of what what um, what do you what do you see as um, as what what brought you to uh, to the point where you're you're writing this? Because obviously you're not really um, from as I am not. You're not from the financial um, advisory world, you know, and, and I don't think uh, Craig is either. So. How, how has it come about that you, you guys have now decided to, to write a book about um, this approach? Right. So, uh, you know, if, if, you've, if you've read my forum post, you know, I really, I really enjoy writing about this topic. I really enjoy exploring all of the different tentacles that it stretches into different parts of life. Um, and, and I think, you know, 
Craig enjoys doing that as well. And I think everybody fantasizes about writing a book about something at some point. But what happened in our case is we just had a member of the forum who actually works for a major publisher, and he had been reading over some of our posts and just was thinking to himself, you know, this is this is a great idea for a book. Um, <laughs> there's, I mean, there are a ton of books on things that make almost no sense, and frankly, there, there are like almost no books on this topic apart from Harry Brown's. Right. And so he just thought, it, you know, it would be a great idea to 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 have some kind of you know updated treatment of this topic, and so he put us in 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 contact with um, the, the the right people at his at his publisher, and we put together a book proposal, uh, essentially proposing to take Harry Brown's ideas and strategies and descriptions of the permanent portfolio, and update the implementation, mm. uh, uh, kind of with. With the benefit of, of, of thousands and thousands of, of forum posts, you can you can easily identify the areas in Harry Brown's writing that people wanted to know more about, wanted to have more fully fleshed out, wanted to dig into you know a little deeper. And so our thought was we could we could spend a little more time on those topics and and answer some of those questions that 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 people still had after reading Harry Brown's work, and and essentially just uh, presenting the permanent portfolio. In, in light of where we're at today, you know, and, mm-hmm. and, you know, I think part of it is making clear that it's just as relevant and just as useful today as it's ever been. Um, but, but to just answer a lot of those questions that, that have come up over the years. I think it's fantastic. I'm really looking forward to reading it. And I, I think it absolutely is needed. And, you know, it's, uh, it's, um, it's going to be um, fantastic to, to to see you know because I've really enjoyed Harry Brown's book um, and I'm really looking forward to um, you know seeing a, um, a modern take if you like on on this approach um, with in light of um, of many of the things that have changed and I know from your post that the overall strategy that you and Craig adopt is very uh, is very much um, closely linked to to Harry Brown's ideas. What do you think are the real sort of Thing, the kind of, of things that have changed that that we need to look at just in terms of practical implementation. Like what kind of what's happened since Harry wrote that book that you think deserves you know another look at um, how it's implemented. Well, um, you know, people are familiar with the, the the analogy of the frog in the boiling water. If you heat the water up slowly, it won't jump out; it's slowly boiled. But if you throw him in the boiling water, he'll immediately hop out. Mm. And and I think that when you're talking about a lot of kind of disaster, nightmare, emergency scenarios, the perception is that this crazy thing will happen and I'll just jump out of the water and everything, I'll be able to, you know, react appropriately and and it it won't be the disaster that people imagine because I will just behave rationally, you know. But I think what what actually happens is these, 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 these things occur incrementally. So, for example, one of the things that, that Harry Brown wrote about was holding gold in a foreign location in the event that some kind of capital controls were put in place and you weren't able to get your money out of a country that had suddenly adopted these confiscatory you know, policies. And you read that and you think, oh, boy, okay, so that, yeah, right. So the government's going to come take all our money. I bet they're going to take our guns at the same time. You know? And it, it, when, you put, when you put it like that, it seems far-fetched. But when you look at what's actually happened in the U.S. over the last uh, 10 or 11 years, it has become harder and harder and harder to move your assets easily, you know, in and out of the country. Mm. If you go to Switzerland and try to set up an account, they'll tell you we don't do business with U.S. citizens anymore. And uh, you find that there's been this kind of chilling effect around the world as the U.S. has essentially told other governments don't make it easy for U.S. citizens to move their capital to your financial system. Mm. And the, the pretext, of course, is that we're trying to catch the drug dealers and the tax evaders, and, and maybe they are. But the net that they're casting is so wide that you are putting, in effect, putting in, 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 into effect a kind of de facto capital controls that if you were to everything we have in place today, and one day, I think the American people would have would have been shocked. You know, they would have they would have pushed back hard against it. Mm. But it's happened incrementally and slowly enough that people really haven't been paying attention. And so we're essentially, essentially, one of Harry Brown's strategies that he described in Fail Safe Investing, of 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 having a a Swiss gold account, 
that that option really is no longer available. So right. if you want to do that, you have to go you have to go elsewhere or be a little bit more creative. Excellent. And your book is going to provide some thoughts on how you can try and achieve the same sort of strategic results without doing the without being able to use those particular tactics is that right that that's right that's right and and, and really you know craig much more so than me has has just done a, a fantastic job of of researching that topic and putting together a a really uh a really comprehensive overview of, of kind of where we're at today and what still works and, and what what the options are so um i, I was i was real i was really impressed with 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 how good that part of it turned out um just because you know, craig has just spent a, a lot of time and and, and thought on in that area mm. you know i mean it's interesting because I, I think i find that area one of the the sort of it, most um perceptive parts of of what harry brown's um uh concepts sort of has provided because yeah, he's been able to, in, in the approach to, as an individual, in the approach to investing, he's been able to provide um, a strategy that, that accounts for some safety and security for kind of real disaster type scenarios without you having to, you know, go and live in the woods, you know? <laughs> that, that, is, that is so true. That, 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 and that's so, I, I think that Harry Brown's approach is so, it's so realistic and it's so lacking in kind of an alarmist tone mm. and approach. And because I think what often happens is if you're, if you're someone who really believes the world's about to end, you get invested in that and, and you get tied up in that. And it becomes hard for you to see when things are simply not happening that way. And, and when you get a lot of prosperity and no doom, it's it's hard to accept that and adjust to it, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I think that having a strategy where you say, you know, I'm not, I don't think the world's going to end, and I don't, I don't, but it, it might. And I, I essentially just want to be fully prepared for whether, you know, you know, it's sunny tomorrow or it rains tomorrow. Yeah. Because I just I don't know what's going to happen. Mm, absolutely. And I would say that you know, interestingly enough, like I, I was reading a a book um, recently. I don't know if you've heard of it called. Wealth, War, and Wisdom by Barton Biggs. Um, you know, I haven't read that book, but I read uh, some reviews of it when it came out. I guess it's been three or four years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, uh, I, it's not a fantastically written book, in my opinion, because I found it a little bit repetitive. But it is interesting just looking at, you know, through the Second World War and the 30s and, and 40s, um, what happened to individual savers and investors in different parts of Europe as the Second World War kind of loomed and then and broke out and stuff. And he talks about, you know, the different experiences that individuals had um, as um, private savers and investors. And I found it very interesting to, to reflect on the fact that, you know, you know, yeah, we don't, you know, we don't have to go and live in the woods and plan for um, a, a war or hyperinflation or so forth. Nonetheless, um, it's good to know that, that, if really bad things happen, you can have a strategy in place to do something to to be able to, uh, you know, to survive and deal with that situation. And I think that there's a balance to be struck between enjoying your life and enjoying all of the wonderful things that we have in, in the world as it currently is, um, but still having, um, you know, making provision for difficult circumstances that might occur. And I think the, the kind of approach of having some of your savings outside your country of origin and geographically um, in, some, in some way is a, a really um, sort of realistic but still um, not, not kind of um, overboard uh, way of, of coping with that. Yes, and I think that, that, you know, history gives you all the lessons that you're willing to, to learn on, on this sort of topic because what you see in history is this endless process of governments and institutions failing on a pretty regular basis. And what you have left over are the people. And the people are then left to try to reassemble society into some new way that's responsive to whatever the new needs are and whatever the, the old system wasn't responding to. And so if you see this pattern of just people constantly having to, to pick up the pieces and, and put things back together in response to a changing world, 
um, why not accept the premise that this process is likely still continuing? And I think that, right. you know, you're, you're certainly seeing it in places like Greece, uh, you know, in the, in the, you know, a, a decade or so ago, you were seeing it in Argentina. And then, you know, before that, you, 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 you saw it in the Soviet Union in the late 80s. Um, these sorts of changes are not unusual at all. And it's not that, that you're a pessimist or, or, or a doomer or anything like that by simply observing that history is packed with these examples of institutions kind of having their own life expectancy. And, and they go through a period of, of where everything seems to be working well. And then they go through a period where nothing seems to work well. And it gives way to a new system, and it and it becomes you know something that that works well for people. But during any of those transitions, you normally see that that people's assets are just destroyed because often they are fully invested in that society. You know, mm-hmm. and, and when something goes haywire in that society, um, they find that they 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 lose everything. And uh, you know, I, I think that <clears throat> at, at any given time. Over, over the course of a single human lifetime, you could easily see, uh, you know, one, two, or three very major, you know, uh, upheavals in the world that you would really want to be prepared for. So if you lived in Europe, you could have easily lived through two world wars in the 20th century, um, a, a lot of inflation, and a lot of other really bad things that if you had tried to tell people that's what was coming at any point in time, they would have said, that just sounds insane. What are you talking about? That there was that, that, why would you, why would you think that, you know? Um, but that's just the way the world is, you know, I mean, it's unpredictable and, uh, you know, really great things happen that no one thought were going to happen. And the same thing, you know, terrible things happen that no one thought were going to happen. And, And having, uh, an investment strategy that can at least kind of give you peace of mind that that the money that you work hard for there's a way to there's a place to put it that you know essentially the incompetence of others is not going to cause you to lose right absolutely and you could say the same thing about um, fiat currencies that you know it, however unlikely it seems that we could have a hyperinflation a sort of destruction of the currency type event. They do happen, and they happen uh, all the time in in history. And there's lots of examples, even in the last sort of 20 years of of, uh, currencies um, uh, going that that way. Um, Even though, you know, that might be a relatively um, unlikely scenario, it's good to know that through, for example, in the permanent portfolio, through the the gold holding, that even if that kind of um, very unusual event took place, um, you know, it would still be possible to um, to weather that storm, so to speak. Oh yes, and, and I think too, if if you look around the world today, there's not there's not a single nation that wants a strong currency. Um, every, it's almost like everyone is in this 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 devaluation derby, you know, yeah. to see to see who can do it in the most consistent, orderly way. But nobody wants a strong currency. I think that's a really interesting question, and that you know, sort of, do we? Does, does the, the U.S. and the U.K. kind of wander into Japan-type long-term slump, or, or where, or, or go into um, you know a more significant inflationary period? And yeah, well, I guess we'll we'll find out. But I guess that's the beauty of the approach of of just having a strategy where you're protected in each of these situations. Is that on one level, you know, although it's not going to be nice, not going to be nice to see either of those situations. At least we can prepare to um, prepare for them. And two, I think that individual investors often find investing to be a very demoralizing and frustrating experience because they they do the things that their advisors tell them, but it just it often just doesn't seem to work out quite right. Mm. And so, to, to me, for someone who's not interested in becoming an expert on the markets and, and and everything there is to know about investing, having a strategy that you can simply put your money into and not have to pay attention to and worry about and, and, and read the paper every day to make sure there's not some different, you know, change in allocation you need to make. I think that that can be a tremendous resource for the right kind of investor, you know, and the permanent portfolio is definitely not for everyone, but, but for, for people who are looking for a certain kind of safety and stability, I just, I think it can just be a marvelous, you know, choice. Mm. So when do you anticipate the book um, coming out? 
Well, we, we're we finishing up the manuscript right now, and the publisher will probably spend, uh, I don't know, two or three months, uh, you know, doing their work on it, and then there will probably be a little bit more editing after that. So I, I would anticipate it would be out sometime in the fall um, or that time frame. Awesome. Cool. Well, um, just for people who want to find out more, um, could you just uh, uh, tell people um, how to find the Permanent Portfolio Forum that uh, you and Craig um, run and, uh, and contribute to, and also if they want to find out more about your book, I think you have a, a mailing list and so forth. So would you well, mind sure. giving the URL and those links? You bet, you bet. The, the forum is uh, gyroscopicinvesting.com slash forum. And then uh, Craig runs his permanent portfolio blog, and that is uh, Crawling Road. And I think it's Crawling Road crawlingroad.blogspot.com or crawlingroad.com. But if you Google Crawling Road, you'll, yeah. you'll find it. And between those two resources, you can find out about anything about the permanent portfolio that you would want to know. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure uh, talking to you, Mike. And uh, I look forward to hearing more news about how the book is coming along and, uh, and uh, indeed uh, hearing when it comes out. Well, thanks, Jake. I really, I really enjoyed talking with you today.